thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm going to begin our service with a slide presentation that the family has put together. And um, one request we would, if you just kind of double check those cell phones, make sure they're off, that would be probably helpful. Thank you and we'll look forward to the slides.
Thank you for those pictorial remembrances. Rosalinda Teodora Garcia, dessert, known as Nina. Her name, Rosalinda, means pretty rose. And I think the Lord worked it out to give us a rose on the program there in a special way. I want to just mention uh, that Ruth Schaffner, who works for the Tiger School District, is in the nursery. If you have occasion to need some help there with a the little one, she's there right in the northwest corner there. And the service is being video recorded, uh, not live streamed, but it is, uh, will be available in a day or two. And um, you can access that through the church website. And that website address is not too lengthy, but it is found in our church informational brochure in the what we call the track rack there as you would depart. So feel free to pass that information on to others. As we come this afternoon to remember Nina, it, it, it's a little difficult uh, at best, but maybe more so in that she loved Christmas and it's five days away and, and it is hard for all of us when we miss our loved ones. Both of my parents have gone on and we miss them. But it's a time when we realize in the seasons of life that God loves us and he wants to comfort us. It may seem difficult that he would be able to do that, but he's, he's all everything. It's omnipotent, omniscient, ever present, and he wants to encourage us, strengthen us, help us. Let's begin our service with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of remembrance, this time to honor. Lord, this time to thank you for the blessing of these really many years now that you've given Rosalinda to family and friends. Lord, we thank you for your love for each of us. And as maybe the most well-known verse in the Bible says that you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in you should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for that, and we thank you for this time together. We ask for your special working in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Mr. Leighton Dessert, fourth son, is going to bring the eulogy, followed by his wife, Sarah, who promised three years ago that she would sing at her mother-in-law's funeral. We'll follow the eulogy and song, singing that really well-known song, Amazing Grace, the words written by uh, John Newton, who, if you would ever want to read the history of his life, you'd find an amazing um, working of God in his life, hence the words, amazing grace. Dad, brothers, family, loved ones, Pastor Ben, thank you for coming today in honor of the life of my mother, Nina Dessert, and thank you to the Westgate Baptist Church for hosting us here. My name is Layton, and I'm the youngest of Rosalinda's four boys. Although the last few days have been difficult, I find myself counting blessings. I am blessed to have such a kind, loving woman for a mother. If you are here with us today or grieving with us in spirit, we are blessed to be those lucky enough to have met Rosalinda. One would be awed at the human heart to see how great a love it can hold. My mother had enormous love for her children. I know she was proud of us all, proud of the men we grew up to be. She loved her husband. What an inspiration they were to us all, teaching us how to love your spouse. For 36 years, they loved deeply, selflessly, genuinely, and completely. 
my mother, my mother was able to help my dad through his own battle with cancer, even as she battled her own. She loved her brothers and sisters, her nieces and nephews. She loved all things warm. She loved to dance to 80s music. She loved celebrity gossip, Native American paraphernalia. She loved collecting things, nativity scenes, and color-coded dishes. My mother loved food. One of the ways that she expressed love was with food. No matter how busy she was or tired after a long day of working at Fred Meyer, she would make sure that her husband and all of her sons would come home to delicious food. In fact, I found that one of the few things that really made her angry was when we would invite friends over without warning her in advance, giving her little time to preheat the oven. During the holidays, she would cook a super abundance of food. This was perhaps a side effect of growing up with 11 siblings. However, I think the habit stemmed from her desire to make sure that everybody was comfortable. People often said that my mother would make them feel like they were a part of the family. My mother loved the holidays. On Easter, my brothers and I would wake to find baskets bursting with eggs and candy with our names on it. During Christmas, my mother would stuff our stockings, put gifts under the tree from Santa. She continued these traditions for years, even after we started noticing patterns like how my mother's shopping basket looked a lot like the gift Santa would leave for us the next morning. <laughs> even these last few years, we still found gifts from Santa. Granted, these gifts may have grown up with us. The last few years, Santa gave us a few more scratch and win tickets than we were accustomed to. <laughs> the magic and the mystery that we experienced as children were no longer there. However, these gifts offered us a different kind of enchantment. The magic that had come forth arose from the love and kindness that my mother had for us as she continued these customs. Mystery had given way to tradition, and there was wonder in that too. It was a yearly reminder of memories that we cherished together. My mother had such strength. One thing that many of you have heard about my mother is that she gave herself a strict deadline for grief and would move forward from that point in time. In 2002, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Although I remember when my brothers and I were told, I can't remember her ever crying about it. As the years passed, my mother didn't run away from the prognosis. Instead, she incorporated it into herself. Having cancer was a part of who she was, but she never let it conquer her. She talked about it openly. Um, sorry, she talked about it openly and would speak of a doctor's appointment as though it was another day at work. She never let her disease become her crutch. A few years ago, after a Thanksgiving meal, my mother was complaining of abdominal pain. The pain became so bad that we ended up calling the ambulance. When they arrived, the paramedics went into the bedroom and helped my mother up onto the stretcher. Sarah, my wife, and I watched as four young, strong male paramedics lifted her over their shoulders. As they were taking her out of the house, my mother turned to look at us and smiled slyly. It was so difficult not to smile as we watched her being whisked away, a queen on her palanquin. Even in discomfort, she always had a way of making others feel at ease. It turns out she had eaten too many fatty foods that Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> many of you remember the health scare we had in 2013. Sarah and I were in Israel, uh, though we did not know how serious the situation was. While in Israel, we visited the Wailing Wall, a holy place in Jerusalem. At the wall, people write prayers on small scraps of paper, fold these prayers and place them into crevices of the wall hoping that their prayers will be answered. Some say that these prayers placed on the wall ascend directly to heaven. At the time, I placed a prayer wishing for more time with my mother. At the hospital, doctors told my family that my mother had seven to 10 days left to live. After we heard the grave news, we returned as quickly as we could. As we waited for the deadline, our fears gave way to hope and we discovered that the miracle woman had more aces up her sleeve. We were all fortunate enough to be granted extra time, more than I could have ever prayed for. These three years, my mother gained two grandchildren. She saw a second son get married and a third engaged. How astonishing, how astonishing it was to get so much extra time with her, 
and what milestones we saw together in that time. I would like to share something with my oldest brother, Roger, who will be getting married in June. When mom thought she would not make it to Sarah and my wedding, she told us not to be sad. Instead, she told us she would, in fact, be attending, flying overhead as a honeybee, buzzing over the unsuspecting crowd, helping herself to a share of peach pie. <laughs> Regrettably, she will not be able to attend your wedding in the traditional sense. Instead, take care at the wedding not to swat at the honeybees. The other day, I came across a previous journal entry of my father's. Three years ago, my father changed some words to one of his favorite poems in order to modernize it, perhaps, or to make it more relevant to us. This is a rephrasing of John Donne's valediction for bidding morning. Let us depart without a sound. No tears, no tempests should be near. It lessens love when wails abound, the moans when leaving one held dear. Most people cannot bear the absence of contact with the one desired. They cannot admit the loss of sense since touch is where their love is sired. But we with love so pure and fine give in to others' soul's demands while touching softly soul and mind need less the eyes, the lips, the hands. Our minds do not fear the dread when one of us must go from reach. Our hearts beat thin the golden thread and thus expand without a breach. If we are two, then we are so as a circle making compass goes. Your soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move but does when the other does. And though one in the center sit when the other far doth roam, it leans and beckons after it and stands up straight as one comes home. Like the compass you are to me when we separately do run, thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I'd begun. To my dad, my inspiration of love and devotion. Though mom roams now, you will be home together again. To my mother, I miss you. Take care of our little Isaac Jamie. You taught me how to love unconditionally and to share every part of myself. I love you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart.
Jesus, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. If you get a chance to read the words to that song, uh, there's a, a, a whole lifetime of a story there in a man's relationship with God. And uh, when God created us, he made, made the world perfect, but our representatives in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, messed it up. They disobeyed, they sinned, but God in his mercy, and that's what amazing grace is all about made a way for us to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. The quality of Nina's life has been amazing to hear of. I just heard about her over the years through Joe as he refereed our ball games and kept the coaches in order and uh, the players learning and growing. I am um, just before the family and friends may share some things, let me just tell you one incident that happened a couple of weeks ago. Joe was refereeing seven games back to back. Well, we did give him a 30-minute break in the middle. But he disappeared. And when he came back, I kind of wondered if he was okay. That's a lot of games to referee. He said he'd just gone to take care of some special needs Nina had. And that's a picture of love in action. And I am appreciative of that incident. And, um, and love goes both ways. And uh, I've heard of much of that in recent days. Family would like to give some time for you to reflect and uh, share some memories. Jessica and Kayla will begin with a letter from Nina to you. And you're welcome to use these two microphones down here. It's closer to you and a little less scary. So either one is fine. And Jessica and Kayla, if you would come. This is to family and friends from Nina. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for all the love, friendship, and support. We touched each other's lives in so many special ways it would take an eternity to mention. I know my presence will be missed as I will miss everyone. I have answered the call into the great kingdom where we will someday meet again. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Joe, for our children and those special memories. Love, Nina. And now I have a list of names. Thank you, great husband Joe. My sons, Roger, his fiance, Rachel, Jonathan and his family, Kayla and Ashton, Benjamin, 
Clayton and his family, Sarah and Isaac and baby on the way. Brothers and sisters, Agapito and Anne, Margarita, Alfredo and Kim, Joe and Christina, Magdalena and Steve, Simon and Diane, Raphael and Bonnie, Benjamin and Velma, Christina and Oscar, Elizabeth and Jim, Julia. Mike, Rita, and Rihanna, Scott, Jessica, and Gabriel, Daniel, Marisol, Danny, and Ethan, all nephews and nieces, tios, tias, primos, primas, and their families, Jan, Jean, Georgina, Tim, and so many special people I loved. Although my time ended early, I am blessed to have had so many memories shared by special friends and family. I thank Jesus for time with everyone. Thank you to the hospice and staff at the hospital. Thank you to Gateway Baptist and Pastor Ben Jackwith. You're welcome to come and share that which uh, would be on your heart. write the words, I just can't say the words, so Ben's what's going to help. Start. <laughs> Start helping now. <laughs> I brought these up. I don't know why. <clears throat> Opposites. Nina stands a short, four eleven, oh, and a half. Four and eleven and a half inches. I stand tall, six foot. Nina married an old man, 29 years old. I married a young girl, 24 years old. Nina likes movies that have been made from books. I like books that have been made into movies. Nina has beautiful caramel legs. I have shark belly white legs. <laughs> uh, Nina can walk by a plate of chocolate candy. I am addicted to chocolate. Nina walks in the summer sun. I walk in the autumn shade. Nina loves football. Go Cowboys. I love basketball. Blazers all the way. Nina can be childlike. I can be childish. Nina is a warrior. And I am a warrior. It is obvious that we were made for each other, isn't it? Have I told you yet today, Nina, how much I love you? I would daily ask Nina this and I would finish it up with some sort of foolish simile, but not right now. It is notable that Nina is best friend to a lot of people, and somehow it works out that they are her best friends also. I know that logically that does not work, but Nina makes it work. She is an assortment of perspective, love, humor, wit. I have four examples. Number one. Back in 1982, on an application for an apartment, she listed her hobby as floating. <laughs> Don't you mean swimming, Hita? I asked. No, she frowned, with one eyebrow raised, questioning my confusion. Floating. I don't enjoy swimming, just floating. <laughs> Have I told you yet today, Nina, how much I love you? Number two. In June of 2012, my siblings, Nina and I, went to have a family reunion in Big Bear, California. The mountains are steep there, and we drove past many precipitous cliffs. Those cliffs frightened all of us, except my brother Mike when he was driving. <laughs> when, he, we drove around, when we drove down the single car width mountain lane to park in front of their home, I needed to turn around. There was a parking spot built near the edge of a cliff, and I started to use the spot to turn the van around and go back in front of Jerry Lynn and Gary's house. As I started to turn toward the cliff, Nina commanded, stop, stop, let me out of the van, I want out. 
Why do you want out? I asked. It's too dangerous, let me out, she said. <laughs> oh, I said, teasing. It's too dangerous for you to stay in the car, but it's okay for me to continue turning the car around. It's okay for me to go over the cliff, is that right? <laughs> she said without a moment hesitation, somebody has to tell the kids what happened. <laughs> I let her out. We laughed and I survived the U-turn. Nina, have I told you today how much I love you? Number three. Nina had an interesting perspective on death. In February of 2012, after she had been battling stage four breast cancer for 10 years already, we learned that I had stage four prostate cancer, which I believe is currently resolved, but we sat in my oncologist's office. The doctor said the statistics would predict I had between five and 10 years to live. I glanced at Nina to see her reaction was. It was sort of like the first time I asked her out on a date back in September of 1979. There was no reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even sure she was listening. In either of these two instances, when we got home from the doctor's office, I asked her, Nina, did you hear what the doctor said? What, she asked. That I would have five to 10 years to live? She looked at me and shook her head as if to tell me I was being foolish. She said, how long did you expect to live? <laughs> it made me laugh. And we never talked about that again. <laughs> <laughs> Nina, have I told you yet today how much I love you? Who's number four? Yeah. In 2015, came home from school one day. I walked into our bedroom. Nina was surprised to see me and her hand was raised in the air like a princess waving during a parade, except her hand was frozen mid-wave. What are you doing, I laughed. I am blowing kisses to the pictures on the wall. I looked at the numerous photographs on the wall, comprised of pictures of her four boys, pictures ranging from 25 years ago to five years ago pictures of Nina and me, and one picture of Tia Amparo. I'm glad I love you, I said, because I think it's cute. Other people might think it's a bit strange for you to be sitting in bed, blowing kisses to the pictures on the wall. Why would it be strange, she asked. I do this every day. <laughs> Nina, have I told you yet today how much I love you? I have one major regret in life that I didn't meet Nina earlier, so we could have spent more time together. Nina, you are a wonderful mother, wife, sister, cousin, grandma, and yes, my best friend. I love you, Nina, completely, like a sponge loves water. I feel like Penn and Teller. <laughs> You don't have to, you can stay though, if you want. Stay. Okay, so this is mine. And I'm gonna begin with a quote that I love by Andrea Gibson, which feels very appropriate today for the person I love most of all. Now my heart is a pressed flower in a tattered Bible. It is the one verse you can trust. So I'm putting all my words in the collection plate. I'm setting the table with bread and grace. My knees are bent like the corner of a page. I am saving your place. We are here today to celebrate the memory of Rosalinda Teodora Garcia Dessert. She was so many different things to so many different people. For someone so small, she was larger than life and she had the names and monikers to prove it. Nina, grandma, daughter, niece, cousin, sister, aunt, friend, weed, pygmy princess, advisor, word maker upper, <laughs> rebelizer of the troops, juggler of the schedules, life giver, warrior, Rosalinda, 
Lupita. But to me, she was mostly just my ma. I consider myself lucky, so freaking lucky to have her as my mom. She created a home that was not just the three brothers and dad that I adore, but she transformed the space around her, the world around her into something special. Everyone was welcome and everyone was fed. She was always a fighter. She had no time for pity and faced every adversity with a smile and a cute hat. <laughs> she would never give up and she would never let you give up on yourself. Once, ever, af once after a particularly rough year of being sick and with problems at work, I decided I didn't feel like Christmas. And one of the kindest gifts I've ever received, Ma broke into my apartment and set up a Christmas tree because she was not gonna let me skip a year at Christmas. And it was the saddest, most lopsided Charlie Brown tree <laughs> that, <laughs> that even had to be propped up against a wall so it wouldn't fall over. And she would also call me all the time. And when I asked what she was calling for, she told me, I'm your mom. I don't need a reason to call you, so I'm going to and you better answer. <laughs> and although Ma is gone, I feel her all around me. She is in each of my brothers and Roger's ability to connect with people, always making a friend and also his fondness for food. In Jonathan's playful nature, his calming presence, and his willingness to act silly if it'll make you smile. And you see her in Leighton's unwavering patience and the ability to see the good in things. But if you want to know about my mom, you look at the way she loves. Witness the devotion she inspired out of her brothers, sisters, and my dad. My mom and dad created a family that is full of life and joy and so much laughter. When you think of my parents, you see the spirit of love. You see that which most people strive for and what so few are able to find. He could reach things on the tall shelf and she would hide things on the low. <laughs> he would constantly tell bad jokes to make her smile and she would laugh or roll her eyes, but she never failed to be his audience. Theirs is a love that goes beyond the words that anyone could use to describe it beyond devotion, beyond kindness, beyond grace. They taught us about family, about how to laugh when things seem scary. Ma is the one that fed our bellies and nourished our souls. She was Christmases and Easter's and every day's and a little bit of Dutch bros. <laughs> I spelled that. Hers is a spirit that makes you, in the present tense, want to celebrate. She was, is, and will forever be my gentle heart. And I wrote a poem to honor her. My fierce gentle heart, dream with me here for a moment before I realize that you are gone. I know this will be hard, but Ma, you promised that it would be worth it. Years ago, everyone thought that you were done. The world dimmed and closed in. We loved you dearly. We sang songs, wanted to stay with you, to hold your hand and wait till the end. You promised that this would be so, so hard, but still you smiled. Ma beckoned us close, so we all gathered to say goodbye. But she loved true stories and surprises, so she decided to become both. Ma wanted us to have a front row seat, to first hand witness a miracle, to feel the humble hand of God, a true story, to see how prayers can sometimes be answered to prove to us all that this would be hard, but it was never meant to be impossible. And if love was enough, she would still be here. She was a warrior. She loved fiercely. 
she lived well. She was my best friend and the greatest person I've ever known. I love you. So I'd like to start off by saying thank you to everyone for coming, and special thanks to my dad, my brother Ben, Michael Ralph, and Chris, and Julian and Maggie, and everyone else that helped care for my mom for so long. I'd just like to share just a short story about my mom. My mom was the type of person who put others first. I'm sure everyone here knew that about her already, but what you may not know is what happened behind the scenes. An example of that would be Easter. She would work all day the day before, come home, then stay up all night to cook. Then the next morning, while still cooking, her and dad would tell us to get the house clean, which is impossible with four boys. <laughs> she could be annoyed by us kids or upset that something was not ready in time, but right when someone came through the door, a magic switch came on and she was happy again. <laughs> That's when we knew we could take it easy. <laughs> a bit later in the afternoon, she would then crash on the couch while people were still over there. She just wanted to make sure everyone had a good time and ate. She would then muster the strength to pack leftovers for everyone to take home because she cooked enough food for 20 people, even if she knew only 12 people were coming. My mom was our family glue. I know, I looked it up on Urban Dictionary. And I quote, family traditions, something that unites all family members. I think she embodies that. Even if it wasn't a cheerful event, people would come out to support her because she made everyone feel like family. The nurses up at St. V must have been so annoyed with our endless barrage of people coming to chat or support her and breaking the maximum capacity and visiting our rules. We would sing Disney songs and play Where's Waldo? <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, that's where I'd go run out of the hospital and hide in the parking lot somewhere. <laughs> and everyone would try to find me from the window. I was just happy they actually played along because I could have been out there for a long time. <laughs> She would be weak at times and maybe not even remember, but she would try to play along with us. She never blamed anyone for her illness. She never complained unless she was cold or wanted a Dutch Bros. And sorry, that was probably me that got her addicted to those. She never looked for pity. When people would ask her how she was, if she hadn't seen them for a long time, she'd be open and blunt. I would hear her tell people, I'd have people tell her that they're sorry, and her response would be, why are you sorry? It's not your fault. She was a real fighter. I don't think she would want us to be sad today. I think she would want us to look at the bright side and spend as much time with each other as we can. I love you, Mom, and can't thank you enough for everything you did for me. I almost regret cutting my up here now, but <laughs> it's just, just that it's high. <laughs> uh, 
Um, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Roger. I am the eldest of my brothers and my mom's favorite. Uh, <laughs> I want you. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, my mom loves gatherings of people. Uh, I know she would have cooked all the food for everybody, um, and on my dad's teacher salary. <laughs> um, as some of you may know, uh, I was laid off of work last year. This is not a bad situation because I was able to go to the house more often to see my mom. Hey dad, can you come here and pinch me every now and then? <laughs> <laughs> Um, sometimes I would just go to the house and watch TV. Or you can read. Because <laughs> I'm so good at talking on this. <laughs> it's, it's not yours. <laughs> and she would talk to me about random things, gossip or classes I was taking. Sometimes she'd just sleep with the TV on. I'd lay down, watch TV, but change the channel. Because she would often watch a soap opera or that show with all the ladies talking about Donald Trump and stuff. <laughs> and celebrity gossip. <laughs> Many of you know how awesome of a person she was. She would take in anybody and feed them. That was her thing. You came over and you ate her food. While I was <laughs> in the Navy, I'd bring friends down to stay the weekend. and She would feed them even though, I, even though I didn't tell her. When I came back from deployments, my mom along with my dad and other family members would always meet me at the pier. I oftentimes came home to visit and when I didn't have a car, or I'd leave my car with them, she would always drive with me. Even if we got to Everett, Washington at midnight, she would drive back or convince me to get her, her a hotel room <laughs> to leave the next morning. My mom was the kind of person that would do anything she could to help somebody, even if it was to send my brothers or myself or one of my uncles to do it for her. <laughs> now, in our classes, we take turns reading. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the strongest memories I have of my mom was when I skipped school and she came home and lectured me. She told me she would do anything for me to graduate on time. She would stay home and work if that's what it took. Instead, she sent me to a muggy, hot, insect-filled city named Corpus Christi to finish school. <laughs> Living in Texas wasn't all bad. There were two days that the temperature was below 50. January 3rd, 1998, <laughs> December 11th, 1999. <laughs> the best thing I learned from living there was to see how my mom was raised. The family there often got together at least twice a month, but usually it seemed like every weekend. From them, I learned why my mom loved family so much and why she liked having people over and why she could sleep in a sauna. <laughs> my mom was a strong woman she fought hard for a long time to stay with us as she could. Her turn. <laughs> <laughs> to see two of her sons get married and meet two of her grandkids. She survived 11 siblings. Texas. <laughs> Uncle Fred. <laughs> <laughs> she often said he can be a handful. <laughs> a big four handful. Boys. Oh, four boys and a husband, all with that wonderful smile that is forever imprinted in my memories. Three years ago, when my mom went into miracle mode, she told me, told me to stay strong because I was strong like her, to stay happy because I have been happy my whole life. You were, you were happy, <laughs> even my little baby. You just, just, just sit in the crib. Just, just stay in the paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and he likes food, like his mother. <laughs> to keep my sense of humor because it keeps me smiling. <laughs> and to marry Rachel because she could do better. <laughs> <laughs> um. Thank you again for coming to celebrate my mom. I know she appreciates it, and most I most certainly do. Mom? <laughs> I know you know, but I want to tell you that I'll miss you. I will tell stories about you, and I won't send my kids to Texas unless I need to. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, Mom, I love you most. Okay. 
Pastor, it's a good thing I only have four boys. We could be here a long time. <laughs> I think there will be some opportunity during the fellowship time for some sharing, but if there's several others, um, you're welcome to come. Joe, Joe asked me how long I thought the service would be. I didn't know. How. He had so many relatives. Well, my name's Mark Morrow, and I've known Joe since he was a freshman in high school. So one thing I need to tell you right now, she greatly improved Joe over the years. <laughs> True. But I'm here to read a message from Joe's brother, <clears throat> excuse me, Roger, who can't be with us today. He's in the hospital. He's Mike to you. I'm sorry. I grew up with him, Roger Michael Dessert. I only heard that when his parents were mad at him, but that's not Anyway, Roger writes, I mean, Mike writes. It's, you know, even in my phone it says Roger. It's hard for me to change. Dearest Nina, I'm sorry I can't be here today, but I know that I'm here in spirit. I also know that I will miss you. You shared so much with us and brought so much into our lives. You brought laughter and love. You showed us how important family was and how everyone was family. We learned to love Easter and Christmas through your eyes. You showed us how to face life with courage. You showed us how we could fight for that life, yet at the same time graciously accept what it offered. Thank you for, this is the hardest part right here. Thank you for loving my brother for making him happy, for rolling your eyes at his jokes, and that's hard, believe me. Thank you for four beautiful boys and how their lovely wives, and for their lovely wives and children. It all started with love, love for Joe, and that was shared. Thank you for starting your family, and we've grown to love them all. Most of all, thank you for being you. You have meant so much to me and my family throughout, and we will miss you. Your memory will fill our lives forever. I, have to, I don't think I could come up again, so I'm gonna say it now. <laughs> Nina, for me, was, can you imagine a cloudy day, and you walk outside, and there's a rainbow, and you kind of wonder what's at the end of the rainbow. Then all of a sudden, there's a second rainbow, and you realize it's something special. That's what Nina was. Hello. So um, I've been asked by Joe's sisters, Tonya and Maureen and Suzanne, to extend um, their greetings and love to everyone here who is showing love for Nina today. Uh, they're sorry that they could not be here, but they're certainly here in spirit. And I'm gonna follow Mark and I'm gonna speak on my behalf now. So uh, I'm Jessica, I'm Nina's niece by marriage. And like Nina, I'm married into the dessert family, um, which is kind of a special tribe. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, the dessert family uh, has a lot of strong uh, family traditions, a lot of strong women in the family, um, and, and really, really fantastic men in the family. And so uh, when I was just dating my husband, I could see how special the dessert men were through uh, Nina and also Aunt Rita who also married into the dessert family. So um, for um, Kayla and Sarah and soon Rachel, it's a, a special tribe um, to be part of. But I wanted to share with you today um, a story that I remember and I share with my coworkers all of the time because three years ago 
when Aunt Nina was in hospice, uh, they saw me leave work every day to go visit her. And so my coworkers know this story too. So as we were all witnessing the miracle of extra life and extra time with Aunt Nina, I had an opportunity to ask her what she talked to God about during that time. And she looked at me and she goes, I told him I needed to cook more. Um, so that she did. Um, and this uh, past uh, Thanksgiving, um, when we were going into hospice again, I didn't think we had the right to ask for another miracle. I thought we were pretty lucky with one. Um, but I took comfort in the fact knowing that whatever was happening was an arrangement that Aunt Nina had worked out with God, and it was what was supposed to happen. So I knew that three years ago she talked to God and told me I needed to cook more, and she did. And I'm so grateful and happy for that time and that extra time with family together. And as we approach the holidays, Aunt Nina, please um, make sure that we keep your spirit alive by bringing family together and being together. One of the things Jill mentioned was uh, that someone recently posted, if you were invited to her home, you were treated like family. And uh, surely uh, we hear that uh, this afternoon in a special way. Life for short people. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm <clears throat> Nina's uh, friend for a long time. 20 plus years ago, <clears throat> when I moved to Oregon, I got a job to a temp agency in Tektronics, and that's how I met Nina. I'm gonna tell you what can I say about Nina. <clears throat> the first time I, I knew her, I was working in Tektronix and she came up to me and I got a birthmark, looks like a black eye, very noticeable when I'm stressed. Um, <clears throat> she approached me out of the blue and she asked me, well, people over there are driving me crazy because they keep asking me what happened to you. <laughs> and I, what do you mean? I said, what happened to you, I? Are you gonna tell me? Hello, well, nice to meet you. My name is Daniel. <laughs> Little that I knew that short conversation, many, many years later, was still here, though. She's my best friend. She's my best friend, and she will be forever. My wife, Marisol, para te amor, por favor. My son, Ethan, and my son, Danny, stand up. I want that people know you. Those are special people for Nina, and that's why we're here. <laughs> and that's why we'll be here along the way with the rest of the family, the Garcias, the Desert, and everybody else, because I was one of those people that she made a mistake to fit in because I never left. <laughs> but one thing that I like to say and, and <clears throat> make sure that I day before you. I'm not really going to speak in public, but I want to be here to be one of those people who speak loudly about Nina's kindness, Nina's love for everybody. <laughs> ah, there are many years, I'm sorry, but there are many years, many experience with the family. I hope, I hope uh, this doesn't end. In fact, you guys stuck with me. In my family. But Joe and the kids know, I know the kids when they were so little. I coach soccer. Joe, Nina, and, and I coach soccer with the kids when the kids were younger than my own kids. Imagine that. So, and I love everybody who loves Nina. Everybody comes in the name of Nina is very welcome. I can't tell you how many times I came home after work and I find Nina in my house. <laughs> and I ask, what are you doing here? should be home cleaning your house. 
And you know what her response was always? I should have learned, but her response was, I don't like it. I want to be here. So many times Joe will call Nina and ask, Tita, where are you? I'm, in, I'm at Marisol's house. And she would tell Joe, well, you want to come or you want to stay home? Right, Joe? So it was a lot of time spending together with the family, all the way to Texas, everywhere. So I'm just thankful and grateful to know somebody like her. It touched my soul, invited me into her house, and loved my family. What else can I ask? So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm uh, younger than Nina, <laughs> even though she's smaller than I am. She has a big heart. As growing up, um, we didn't have much toys to play with. We made our own toys. And one of the things we always loved playing was uh, leg wars. You lay down on your back, and then you, you lay on the opposite side right next to each other and then you start counting just like Don Moore one two three you raise your legs and you cross and whoever's strongest will win well that's growing up that's being a male <laughs> you think that you would be dominant uh, well she uh, she proved that that I wasn't <laughs> she just you know we did that one two three thing and next thing you know I'm flipping in the air <laughs> rolling over and like, what the heck happened? You know, I was supposed to take this little girl out. Well, it never worked. Uh, always playing, uh, play jacks, you know, thinking that I could beat her again. But for some reason, this little tiny thing with little tiny hands could pick up all these jacks. And uh, I could never beat it. <laughs> we started playing another game, and uh, it's hopscotch. You know, you let all these little squares, and for some reason I could never make it to the 12th one. You know, and this little tiny thing, just ball of fire, just jumping everywhere, you know, and just didn't know how she would do all that, you know, so. But then, as we were growing up, I found out that she was moving to Oregon, because my oldest sister was here, and Fred. That was a handful. <laughs> but uh, then she had, had graduated, and then she had asked me to move up here. Because for one, I said yes right away, was because it's 100 degrees in Texas. <laughs> and I'm pretty much done there. <laughs> and um, so, I said yes. She said, well, now you got to tell mom you're leaving. <laughs> that was a tough thing to do. <laughs> you don't tell your mom that you're leaving. <laughs> but um, as I did, she went ahead and got everything just like Nina would for me. You know, she got me clothes because it's cold here. And uh, Nina would do the same thing. I work in construction outside, and I weather all the elements. One thing that she would do was call me, and uh, even after chemo and all that, she, I know that she's all drained out. She would call me and say, "Hey, do you need anything?" You know, so she was always looking out for other people. She was always looking out for me all the time, Fred, and all of us. And uh, so those are my things that I, I cherish the most: is her kindness her strength and uh, her appreciation to um, serve her, pretty much serve her, but and help everybody else out. So love you, Nina. Take care.
Hi, my name. Oh. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Jay Galloway. I've known the dessert and the Garcia family for many, many years. Um, she was my aunt. Well, the, out of there are three great women in my life. One is my mother. One was my second mother, Donna, who passed away a few years back, and the third was Nina. The last few years have been really hard, and I just couldn't bring myself to come and see her in this day because the woman I knew, the strongest willed heart, I know she, um, she always made me feel welcome. She always made my family feel welcome. It didn't matter what was going on in my life. The thing I loved most about her is she would always make time for you. And the other thing I liked about her is the very first time I met her, I, was, I used to be a little wild and rambunctious. Probably the boys remember that. I know Joe definitely does. <laughs> and you'd be like, what are you doing? I'd look at her like, <laughs> you know, she's like, just calm down. You're going to be okay. And the other thing about her that I also liked is um, she, she has this calm sense about you. Like she could always bring you down and just calm you and relax you. And that's one of the things I'm going to tr truly and deeply miss about her. Um, the other thing that I really learned from her was her compassion and willing to help others. I actually come to find over the last about 15 years that I've learned that skill from her and I actually continue to do that myself for the past 10 years. I've been heavily involved with the Boy Scouts of America. I learned from Nina that I actually like volunteering and helping others. It brings a great joy and I give Nina all that credit that, that you know, the kindness that she showed me will forever live with me and you know, in fact that I actually take that skill that I learned from her and bring it to everybody else. The other thing I noticed from, that I learned from Nina was to be able to look at somebody and like and try to calm them down, especially in scouting, a lot of people get really nervous all the time and like, you know, it's okay. You know, it's, it's all right to calm down. And I remember Nina teaching me that. And the other thing about Nina was she always had a way of knowing if you're lying to her. <laughs> she would just look at you. I'm like, okay, let's try this again, Nina would always tell me. <laughs> but later in years, um, the other thing I always liked is, because I didn't always come around, the first thing she would do is she would look at me, she would push me aside, and she would instantly grab all four of my kids throughout the years. <laughs> and then she would come back and say, well, oh, hey, Jay, how's it going? <laughs> you know, she always had a love and a passion for kids. And that's the one thing that I hope to continue in her, you know, in her honor and her memory, and also for myself, too. Um, I'm truly going to miss her. And it's really hard to, to stand up here right now and to say that. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Okay, so I'm probably not going to keep it together, <laughs> but I just wanted to say um, it makes me sad that I wasn't here for, and I was in San Diego for so long, but it's been so great to be back, and I just I feel like I never missed a beat. Um, coming back to the house that I have so many memories of the boys, which I used to babysit, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was wise on your guys' part or not. <laughs> um, but growing up, it was just such a, I mean, it was just what you did. You know, we go over to Nina and Joe's, and we would look forward to it, as opposed to we had a different side of the family that was a little more stuffy, and it was kind of more, it felt like an obligation, whereas we would look forward to coming over to Nina and Joe's for any excuse. I mean, we lived close, so we would stop by a lot. And uh, one of my very first memories, it's weird, I fell down the stairs when I was like two. And uh, apparently I was wearing a dress that my Aunt Nina had made for me. <laughs> so she contributed to that, I guess. <laughs> um, but just so many great memories along the way, um, just making us a part of, especially Easter, which I, you know, um, I guess was officially told recently, but should have realized already was her favorite holiday and um, just so many fond memories and how she just embraced all of the children and made everybody feel at home and 
there was always something to eat, no matter what, for sure. And uh, um, just, she told it like it was, and I just love how how Nina and Joe were just such such like a such a pair. They fit like jigsaw puzzle pieces, and uh, it's really just an inspiration to see such a great love and to have such a wonderful woman in my life. Um, and we're so blessed to have had an extra three years with her, and I'm so lucky because I was away, and so I got to spend a little bit of time with her. And she raised four wonderful boys, and you know that's exemplified in the wonderful women that they married, and Ben, you've been such a, a strong person too, to, to be there all the time, and I'm, I'm so happy to know that she had somebody so, so like committed to just making her life as easy as possible when it was a really difficult time, so, um, you know, thank you guys for keeping her strong and positive and being such a, a wonderful light in our lives, and uh, I'll miss her so much, but she's always going to be in my heart. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this afternoon or evening, and there'll be additional time during Food and Fellowship here in a few minutes. I only have five pages of notes. <laughs> Will I get a hug? <laughs> this coming July 5th would have been the 37th wedding anniversary. Where does time go? I want us to go to the Bible for a few minutes because God speaks to all of the issues that we could ever face in life. And one of those is where does time go? Listen, if you would, to James chapter, excuse me, Psalm chapter 90. It says this, the days of our years are three score years and 10. Just generally speaking to a lifespan of 80 years. And if by reason of strength, or seven years, they be fourscore years, eighty. Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So, verse twelve, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Ecclesiastes has much to say about the seasons of life, and time to be born, and time to die, and time to plant, and many other aspects of the seasons of life. But there was a king in Israel recorded to us in the book of 1 Samuel who started out as a shepherd and he penned these words and the references in your bulletin. Psalm 147 verses 3 through 5 says, He healeth the broken in heart, he being God. God alone brings ultimate comfort to us. Verse 4 says, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Joe started to introduce me to his family the other day, and I soon realized I'm not going to remember all these names. But God does. He knows every one of us infinitely. And if he, he who made the stars... And he, God, who has named all of those inanimate objects of space, how much more does he know us and love us whom he created in his image? His image of a conscience. We understand right and wrong because he built that within us. I am trying to catch up to the Garcia family. I guess I have 10 grandchildren. And um, that's hopefully just a start. But those little ones, I don't teach them to lie. Mom and dad don't teach them to 
fudge on things. There's something within. Sarah saying about John Newton's words, referring to the fact that when Adam and Eve sinned, sin came upon the whole human race. But I'm so glad the story doesn't stop there. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But it goes on to say the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I digress just a little bit. Psalm 147 goes on to say, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. In the quiet hours, in the middle of the night, maybe when we can't sleep, missing those who've gone on before us, there is a God we can turn to. And this great king, King David, the shepherd boy who became king and reigned for 40 years, penned Psalm 23. I think you know it. The Lord is my shepherd. I stop there because that third and fourth word in the very first verse, and there's only six verses. The Lord is my shepherd. God wants us to know him personally and individually as our shepherd. In fact, in fact he's called the great shepherd. He's called the good shepherd. He's called the chief shepherd. God uses terms to help us not only relate to each other, but most of all to relate to him. To understand just as, as um, the dessert household is known for hospitality and fellowship and food and care and love. There's a God who, who authored all of that. And he wants us to know him. He wants us to know of his great love. I'm told that Nina liked which FNL, NFL football, the, the, the 49ers? Yeah, 49ers. Uh, they, oh, no, the Cowboys. Uh, uh, um, you look at those uh, ball games on television, you'll often see someone in an end zone with a little placard that says JN3 colon one, six. And that little, when, when uh, um, Florida State used to wear the eyeshadow with JN316, Tim Tebow. In fact, he got, he got all that banned because JN3 colon one, six had more hits People wondering, what is that? Than about any other thing. And the verse says this. It's John 3.16. Probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. That's what Christmas is all about. Without Christ and Christmas, there's no meaning to it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. You see, the greatest gift that's ever been offered is the gift of eternal life. And how was it made available for us? Jesus went to the cross and died there. Sometimes people get uncomfortable when we talk about these things, but it's the greatest truth could ever be discussed. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin because I was, a, I was a sinner from birth. I needed a savior. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. And one day I went to God and I said, I need you to be my savior. Because it's not some automatically dispensed to every individual. It's automatically offered to every individual. But I have to receive it. I'm going to be honest with you. I have never, to my recollection, not opened a gift that was given me. I've opened every one of them. There's one gift in my memory I wish I'd never opened. I had an uncle. I don't know what Uncle Fred might be like, but... But, but I had an uncle 
And I was little, a little boy, and he gave me this can of peanuts. I like peanuts. I opened the lid, and out came this slinky that scared the living daylights out of me. Now, I'm brave and strong at four and five, but I went hunting for mom. Worst gift of my life. But God gave a gift. That's the best gift I've ever received. The opportunity to simply place my trust in, uh, faith and trust in what he did on the cross for me. I couldn't do it. I'm not good enough. I married well to Joe. But my wife can't do it for me. I had to personally and individually say something like this. And it's not the exact words. It's the heartfelt meaning behind these words. I had to say to Jesus, I understand. You died on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. I trust in what you said you did is recorded in the Bible. And you've given me the gift of eternal life. Not based on any good works. Not based on how much I give or serve. It was purely a gift of love. But a gift has to be received. Reminds me of another verse. But as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Maybe there would be one or more or several who would need to pray similarly to what I prayed one day. You see, that's the starting point of a personal relationship with God. The Lord is my shepherd. I need him as my savior. I wish I had time to tell you why God likens us to sheep not lions, big and strong. Have you ever realized that athletic teams don't pick sheep as mascots? Go, sheep, go. Go, sheep, go. Bah. I've never heard that. But God likens us to sheep. Why? Because we need a lot of help. Frankly, we do. I'm going to suggest a prayer you might consider praying. It's going to go like this, and then I'll pray it. If you want to join me in the quietness of your heart, I'd encourage you to. Dear Lord, I've sinned. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. And God said when we do that, Verily, verily, I send to you, whosoever believeth on me has everlasting life. Place and home and heaven forever. Let's bow our heads, please, and as you would, in the quietness of your heart, need to pray that. Let me ask you to join me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the love that you showed mankind when you sent Jesus to die on the cross. He was God. I don't understand all of that. And I can't because you're infinite, but one day, when we're with you and eternity because we've placed our faith in you we'll, we'll understand more fully but for now Lord I ask you to come into my heart be my savior help me to grow spend time in the word of God the Bible get to know you better live for you serve you to the best of the ability that you'll help me thank you for dying for me